Uktaran Heron, President of the Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very honoured to have been asked to give this discourse this evening. Um, I had to think about it because I'm used to doing hit and run speeches, 20 minutes, questions and answers. Uh, I'm not used to doing a full academic lecture, um, so hopefully um, it, will, it will go well. Um, I was delighted to have the opportunity because it gave me a chance to reflect on deeper trends, um, the main forces shaping uh, where Europe is today and where the EU is going in the future. And um, that's what I want to talk about this evening is those forces, those challenges that will determine the future direction of the EU and help me to give um, my answer to uh, will the post-Brexit EU be different? And um, I could stop now by saying yes, but I'm going to spend the next hour um, going into a little bit more detail. Um, and I want to start by saying that um, Brexit is only one of those forces. Um, the um, departure of a big member state is, of course, a significant rupture for the EU. Um, but my thinking is that um, this will actually have a time-limited impact on the European Union, and that the other forces I'm going to talk about will actually have a more profound effect. I want to talk both about the evolution of the European Union over the last 30 years to give a context uh, for answering that question. Um, and the things I'm going to talk about are things like the 2004 enlargement of the European Union, um, the 2005 rejection of the Constitutional Treaty, and the 2008 financial crisis. Um, because I think these three things will have a more profound, lasting effect on the European Union actually than Brexit. Uh, important and all-absorbing as Brexit is right now, I think when we look back on it in 10 years' time, the other forces will, will turn out to have been more important. Um, and I like to talk about the forces shaping and changing the European Union, because for me it's a, a kind of living organism. And it's up to each generation to shape it uh, to suit itself and to give a collective response to the challenges that um, the changing world is throwing up to us. And for me, the EU is about finding that collective response um, to the way in which we can, if not um, influence, at least, uh, if not master, then at least influence uh, what's happening in the wider world at the moment. And it is a process of permanent compromise, and I'm going to talk a little bit about compromise later, later this evening. Um, and that means sometimes that the EU is slow and awkward. But for me, it's by far the best method for sharing our continent that Europe has so far devised. And I often make, and I'm going to make in my talk this evening, the analogy of membership being a journey. Sometimes the views are fantastic. Some bits of the journey are very boring. And you have to factor in also detours and the occasional roadblock uh, along the way. Um, because challenges come up all the time. And um, if you just look at today's agenda, who would have thought a couple of years ago that migration would be such a big issue for the EU today? Um, who would have said that the forces of populism and anti-EU nationalism would be uh, so topical today? And so the EU has to um, overcome uh, the search for simplistic answers to something that's inherently very complex. And we're trying to do all of this in um, a democratic and open society with over 500 million people, 28 member states. Um, and all of those have different views, different preferences for how they live and work. How, uh, how do we get this together? And as so often uh, Jean Monnet, and I'm going to quote him a couple of times tonight, I think he said it very well, and I'm going to quote now when he said, have I said clearly enough that the community we created is not an end in itself? It's a process of change, continuing in that same process which, in an earlier period, produced our national forms of life. The sovereign nations of the past can no longer solve the problems of the present. They cannot ensure their own progress or control their own future. And the community itself is only a stage on the way of the organised world of tomorrow. And I think that's as true today as it was um, when he wrote his memoirs in the 1970s. And of course, this process of being uh, constantly changing and being on a journey is um, some, and, and a journey to a destination that is not uh, totally clearly defined in advance. This is one of the many things that has, I think, frustrated um, both British politicians and British commentators, because they joined the common market. 
and they were very proud of the work that they did on the single market. Um, but for most of them, that's all they wanted from the EU. And so this open-ended journey wasn't something that really appealed to them. Whereas I think, to varying degrees, the other member states accept that the EU is a more fluid organisation. Uh, it doesn't do today everything that it did yesterday, and it won't do tomorrow um, things that we can't even imagine today. So the EU, in my view, will only survive if it continues to adapt to changing circumstance, to changing mood, to the different needs of its members. And I think it has been able to do this well so far. Um, and again, uh, to quote Monet, and I'm only going to quote him three times, so this is the second time, but I, I think he was so right when he said, uh, some people refuse to undertake anything if they have no guarantee that things will work out as they planned. Such people condemn themselves to immobility. Today, no one can say what form Europe will assume tomorrow, for the changes born of change are unpredictable. And that's uncomfortable, but I think most of the other member states um, are happy to, to join in the journey and see where it takes them. And maybe this is the moment to say that the thoughts I'm going to um, uh, talk about today, they come from my 36 years of experience of working in the European Commission as the president um, gave a very brief um, uh, outline of my CV. Um, and in particular, the, my last 10 years as secretary general of, of that institution. And um, in that role, I had the privilege of being uh, in the room when the presidents and prime ministers were alone wrestling with um, very difficult issues like how to save the euro. And the thing that struck me most about sitting in there was that even if it took them all night, and even if they started with very different um, points of view, in the end, they always came to an agreement. Um, they always came to an agreement because no matter how difficult the issue was, what was more important for them was that the EU could continue, that it could uh, continue to make progress. And for me, that means that they understood it as an inherently political process. It, it can be very technical, it can be about economic arguments, it, but it's fundamentally a political process and they understood that. And they also understood it, I think, as the best and, and perhaps the only uh, chance of success for their countries in the early 21st century. Now, the history of the EU shows that it uh, usually moves forward in crisis. Uh, it was born out of the question of how to rebuild Europe after the Second World War. And since then, most of the defining moments, if you look back at different timelines, most of the defining moments have come as a result of crisis. And so my last money quote for the evening is going to be a very short one because he said, people only accept change when they are faced with necessity and only recognize necessity when their crisis is upon them. So I want to take you back to the beginning of the 1990s, the early 2000s, um, and to look at the forces and the crisis that were uh, emerging in the EU at that time and that shaped uh, the future. My recollection is that um, the EU was feeling pretty good about itself then. Um, we had all survived the, the Y2K bug. Uh, the global economy was expanding. People were talking about globalization. Everybody was talking about hedge funds, etc. In 1989, the Berlin Wall had come down. And the process of what I see as righting the wrongs of history and making you know, Europe whole again was well underway. In 2004, the EU had its um, biggest ever single enlargement, uh, bringing eight Central and East European countries who chose freely to join the European Union together with Malta and Cyprus into the EU. And at the end of the 1990s, the EU had decided to um, move to economic and monetary union, so that on the 1st of January 2002, uh, we had the biggest ever cash ha changeover in history, when in 12 EU countries, the euro coins and notes that we know today uh, replace the national currencies in our pockets. So, so these were exciting times, but as so often happens, um, this actually retrospectively turns out to be, have been a moment of hubris, uh, a moment of excessive pride and arrogant uh, self-confidence. There was a feeling that we had invented a new uh, model of growth that the old laws, the old-fashioned fuddy-duddy laws um, of the past didn't uh, apply anymore. Um, but sadly, as always happens, uh, hubris leads to nemesis and downfall. And as we now know, we were not, after all, immune 
to the uh, consequences of making bad choices and taking bad decisions. And so I now want to talk about um, two big political developments that happened then and that I think are still uh, going to shape the EU into the future. The first is enlargement, and the second is the failure of the Constitutional Treaty. Um, for me, uh, enlargement to the East has been one of the big success stories of the European Union. I see it as success in political terms, economic terms, in human terms. And I very much regret that I think it has not been celebrated to the extent that it deserves to have been. Um, if you think back to uh, when Ireland joined the then EEC in 1973, um, it was a much looser organisation, uh, much less integrated than it is today. And weaker countries were given uh, derogations, extra time, to adjust to um, whatever new changes were being introduced. Um, when Spain and Portugal joined in 1985, they had to go through um, a transition period before they were able to participate in the emerging uh, uh, single market. But by the, time of, um, two th by the time the candidate countries of Central and Eastern Europe applied to join, the EU had become a very sophisticated, highly integrated economy, and the bar was set much higher. So a huge effort was needed to align their legislative and regulatory systems to meet the obligations of EU membership. And I'm very proud to have worked on enlargement in the 1990s. So I saw at first hand the effort that these countries made. Um, the parliaments were sitting uh, long sessions to adopt huge amounts of legislation. There was um, a need to recruit a different kind of civil service to have the capacity to be part of the EU. Um, and there was um, uh, need to do all of this in record time. There was a need to change the legal system uh, and to uh, make sure that they could um, uh, join the EU with an independent judiciary and court system. Uh, so all of these things were a huge effort for, for the um, countries of that time. And I think it was a, a fantastic achievement that was done in such a sort of short space of time. A fantastic achievement by the then candidate countries but I think it was also a great achievement of the existing member states and of the institutions in Brussels. It was the first time that we had a serious approach to pre-accession. We had a pre-accession fund in the FAR programme, and um, the member states joined in that effort by lending their own civil servants to the candidate countries to help them master um, the implementation of food and safety rules, public procurement, um, customs procedures, mutual recognition of standards, all of the minutiae that make up um, EU membership. And for me, this was um, a fantastic model of what the EU can do when it has the political will to deliver on a project. Now, given the current problems between the EU, uh, Poland and Hungary, you may find it kind of strange that I say enlargement was such a success. Um, and I am uh, deeply concerned by the uh, apparent disagreement over basic EU principles, like the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, and the freedom of the press. So I want to spend a few moments um, giving my explanation as to why I think that happened. Um, first of all, um, I mentioned um, what an effort it was for the, those countries to, to prepare for membership. Uh, and I think 15 years of preparation had exhausted the political systems in those countries and having achieved the goal of joining they didn't then want the EU to be immediately changing as soon as they had joined so um, they would have been glad of, of a breather uh, but history decided otherwise and very soon after they joined we had the economic and financial crisis and even though they were not in the euro they were swept along by all the changes that that involved so for me the the current problem of a return to a more authoritarian form of government is partly a response to um, the pressures and the sustained effort to, to be ready for accession. Um, it's also partly due to the determination of those countries that once they had joined to be full members and to uh, shape the EU in the direction that they wanted it to go in, not just to acquiesce in whatever EU 15 um, had decided. And I think, you know, both of those, were, sorry, whereas the um, existing 15 felt, well, you know, they knew what they were getting into, they've joined our club, and we have our way of working, and they should just fit in. Now, I think both points of view have some validity, and it's going to take time uh, to, to bring about 
a new, bigger EU that is truly representative of all its member states, not with blocks of old and new, but that reflects the influence that every member brings to, to, what, to, to making up what membership is about. Um, I think that um, it is difficult to say exactly how this crisis will be resolved, but, but I have confidence in the populations of those countries um, because I think that um, they will find um, the right way to solve the problem in the end because they joined the EU for many reasons. They joined it for economic prosperity. They joined it a Western club so as to feel that bit safer as they look east. But I think most of all they joined it because they wanted um, to live in a decent society where individual rights are respected and where the state is not something to be feared. And I think um, we're still seeing the working through of the fall of communism. It is easier to change um, economic and regulatory uh, culture. It takes longer to change political culture. Um, but I am confident that, um, as I say, I put my faith in the populations of those countries, that they do share the same basic values as their Western counterparts and as are enshrined in, in the EU treaties. Now, of course, enlarging um, to 10 countries and going from 15 to 25 member states overnight um, has had an effect on the EU, um, but uh, not often the effects that uh, people think. Um, for example, um, the enlargement is often blamed for a slowdown in decision making, but if you look at the record, that is not the case. The new member states did not um, either politically or legislatively slow down um, the, the decision making process. If you look closely, you will find that most of the problems came from EU15 and, it has to be said, mostly from um, some of the six founding member states. So we have to, to bear that in mind. I think there is a tendency to look with sort of rose-tinted glasses at the, the cosy past of when we were 12 or when we were 15 and to think that everybody knew everybody then and we were all going in the same direction. It's not true. And I don't believe it was even true among the original six. Um, and I think that the kind of problems that have come with enlargement of largely logistics, of having to have bigger meeting rooms because you have to now fit 28 uh, countries in the room, um, of managing to work in 24 languages, these are logistical problems that we can well solve. And that they are small in the scales of the benefits that enlargement has brought and is bringing to, to the EU um, as it goes uh, deeper into the 21st century. Um, so, uh, but I think it's important, nonetheless, that we find a solution to these problems because if the EU is about anything, it's about a set of shared values. That is the thing that our citizens will support uh, well beyond any of the more pragmatic decisions the EU takes. So we have to find a, a way to, to, to resolve them. Um, there is one consequence of the fall of the Berlin Wall that I wanted to pick up and mention, um, and that has to do with the unification of Germany. Um, apart from its importance for Germany, what it did at EU level was to break the previous more or less um, parity of size between France and Germany. Um, and I think that both countries have been struggling since to come to terms with that. France to um, continue to maintain the co-leadership with Germany and Germany not to be seen as dominating the EU because of its size. And I think those are forces that are still working their way through um, at the moment. And that brings me then on to the second uh, big event I want to talk about and that's the failed project for a constitutional treaty for the EU. You remember, um, and Irish voters will especially remember, that the 1990s were a period of several treaty changes. We had the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, we had the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997, and then we had the Nice Treaty signed in 2001. This was also a period when Europe used the convention approach uh, more than just an intergovernmental conference. So um, the member states working with the institutions, but also with um, representatives from the national parliaments. And since the convention approach was deemed to have worked well earlier on, in uh, 2002, a new convention was asked to come up with um, the treaty changes that would be needed for the future. And at the time, uh, you may remember that a lot of people were making comparisons with the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, that was set up to establish the United States of America. And of course, for me, in hindsight, that's all part of the hubris. 
Um, because um, the convention did report, it did come with the constitutional treaty that was amended a little bit by the member states, but uh, in 2004 adopted. And then it was ratified by several member states before, in 2005, being rejected by both France and Germany, France and the Netherlands um, in referenda. So why did it fail? Um, there has been a lot of research into why did it fail. Um, and I just want to, to look at three reasons why I think it failed. Again, I'm choosing reasons which I think um, have an ongoing influence on where Europe is today. So the first one was that there was clearly a split between those who wanted more Europe, those who wanted less Europe. Um, and the so-called elites, I think, um, fundamentally misjudged uh, the public mood at the time. They thought that there was a desire for increased European cooperation and that if that came uh, coupled with improved democratic procedures that people would see this positively, they would see it as a step forward. Um, and as we all know, that's not um, what actually happened. What happened was the exercise came across as a kind of a project of the elites that they were trying to uh, uh, impose on the population with, with more than a whiff of federalism, and that did not have um, popular support. And in fact, this is an aside really, but it is a perennial problem of the most ardent pro-Europeans um, that the public doesn't generally share their appetite for institutional tinkering and for procedural change. Um, and I think that um, the, the third reason why it failed was the usual problem of referenda, that people tend not to answer the question that they're asked and to use the referendum to express dissatisfaction with other things. So, but for tonight, whatever the reasons for the failure, what I'm interested in is the, the sort of lasting effects that this um, failure had on subsequent EU development. And I think most of all, it carried the lesson that you have to bring people with you if you want to make uh, big changes like in a treaty. And you have to be able to explain why change is needed, if in fact it is needed. Um, and for me, um, the rejection of the constitutional treaty in two founding member states, um, has if it, it may not have definitively killed off the federalist tendencies of the most ardent pro-Europeans, but it has certainly scared off um, a generation of politicians from uh, playing with treaty change unless it's absolutely necessary. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes when I talk about the Fiscal Compact Treaty. Um, the second effect of the, the failed constitutional treaty that I want to talk about tonight is that, in my view, it weakened the EU institutions um, because they were seen to have overreached themselves um, and they were accused of trying to foist the United States of Europe on, a, on an unwilling public. And I think more insidiously, um, this whole debacle was used to, um, to, to support an argument that the EU is somehow undemocratic, a perception of it being undemocratic. Now, I don't actually share that perception. I don't think the EU is undemocratic. I think it's misunderstood. I think it's deliberately blamed for many things which, for which it's not always responsible. And I think part of that misunderstanding comes from the portrayal of the European Commission as the government of Europe. And it is not that. Clearly, it is not that. The Commission can take a limited number of decisions, mainly in the competition area, but otherwise, it can't decide anything in Europe. The decisions are taken by the council, where you have uh, ministers voted by their own population to represent them at home in government and abroad in international organizations, and the parliament, which is directly elected by the population of the EU. But that doesn't come across. And the myth of you know, Brussels deciding things um, has become so entrenched now that it's, it, it is used to make the EU seem undemocratic when, as I say, in my view, it isn't really. But what the Commission does have is the power of ideas. And it also has, in my view, a highly capable civil service. And that civil service um, works very hard to find genuinely European-wide solutions to the problems that the member states are unable to solve by themselves. Um, in fact, in my experience, quite a few governments are afraid of um, Commission proposals, so they try to intervene and stop them. Uh, they're afraid because they know that they will appeal to large sections of their, of their population and that once they come out of the Commission, it'll be harder to stop them. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the Commission is always right, far from it. It gets things wrong. Sometimes it's too nitpicking, too interfering in small things that it should leave alone. And sometimes it's not brave enough. It doesn't come with radical enough solutions to problems just because they're not politically popular. 
Um, so, um, as we all know, the EU moved on from uh, the failure of the Constitutional Treaty and the Treaty of Lisbon, thanks to a second vote in Ireland, enacted the institutional changes that were needed to make an enlarged EU function. Um, it brought us um, majority voting as the norm in legislation. It brought us uh, um, equality as co-legislators between the Council and the Parliament. And it brought us um, the High Representative for uh, External Affairs. Um, it also brought us um, a President of the European Council, and the European Council became an institution in its own right, and I'm going to talk about that a little later as well. So, um, those were two big shaping factors, I think, that, that will continue to shape the EU into the future. Now I want to talk about the third one, which is the 2008 financial crisis. Um, it had a huge impact on the EU, and it had a huge impact on, on where we will go next. And I think uh, now, ten years on, having come through it, um, we're already in danger of forgetting just how dramatic it was. Um, I can remember waking up every morning and wondering would the euro survive and what the hell we were going to do if it didn't. Um, and I, I, as I said, I was witness to, to the European Council when they met um, just alone. Um, and they were meeting almost every month um, during the intense um, phase of the crisis. And they were very tense meetings. They went on all night. The prime ministers and the presidents knew that they had to take decisions before the markets opened in the morning, but they didn't know what decisions to take. Um, and gradually it became a sort of a challenge of who's going to blink first, the markets or the politicians. Um, the leaders knew that they had to outstare the markets and they had to show that they had the deeper pockets. And in the end they did that and the rest is history as they say. But this was a, a very scary business um, and with huge consequences if they got it wrong. And so I want to draw some lessons from, from that time. Um, I think what became obvious during the prolonged crisis was that the EU had become so integrated that no member state could isolate itself any longer from what was happening in another member state. Um, it also became clear that promises and expressions of goodwill were no longer enough. Um, it wasn't going to be enough to have cosy compromises between countries to make the euro, um, to make a single currency survive. Um, and um, it's interesting for me to look back because the Commission had actually warned that Greece didn't, probably didn't meet the euro criteria and had asked for powers to inspect the statistical offices of the member states. Um, but that request was refused because the member states didn't want the Commission looking into their affairs. Um, but needless to say, as soon as the crisis struck, the Commission got those powers, but it was too late. Now, I'm not trying to say it would have made a difference, but it's just an illustration of um, how things were and how things have to, have to move on. And things did move on, and they can move on very quickly, because um, I want to recall in 2003, both France and Germany broke the rules of the Stability Pact. Um, uh, but they calculated, rightly as it turned out, that the other member states in the Council would show them leniency when the Commission tried to hold them to account. So if you think of that moment and then five years later, fast forward, um, suddenly the Commission was seen as the only independent body that could um, objectively um, oversee member states' economic and fiscal policies. Um, and the Commission was actually being given more powers than it would ever, ever have dared to, to, to request. Um, and at that time, too, I think the smaller member states kind of rediscovered um, the Commission because up to then they had been more following the uh, stronger intergovernmental tendencies of the bigger member states. Um, but in the crisis, they quickly came back to the wisdom of the founding fathers um, who had um, designed uh, an independent commission that tried to be representative of the whole of the EU and not just the voice of the strongest, uh, the strongest member states. So my, one of my central themes for tonight is that the, the crisis of 2008 changed the EU and changed it permanently. And I think it did that because the euro then became the core of the EU. We were moving beyond the common market, we were moving beyond the single market, we were new, moving now to a much more integrated um, economic and, and financial union. And I think to a much closer way of working that will shape things for, for years to come. And some of you may remember that this was one of the things that bothered the UK, 
they were afraid that the Euro member states would, and they used the word caucus, that they would caucus against them and present them with a pre-decided uh, majority view that would be very difficult to change. Now, I don't think the others ever really had that in mind. But of course it is the case when prime ministers are meeting very often, when finance ministers are meeting once a month, if not more often, and working together to solve difficult issues, that engenders a sense of togetherness and a sense of cooperation, which if you're not part of it, you feel you're missing something, you're excluded from it. Um, so in that sense, um, I can understand uh, a little bit the feeling. And I think it's that understanding of the euro as the core of the future EU that led the three Baltic member states to work very hard to qualify, really qualify, for Euro area membership and to join uh, the Euro for wider security reasons as well as for the economic reasons. But, but it was an understanding that the Euro was going to be the centre, the heart of, of the future EU. Um, of course, throughout this period, it, again, it's interesting to recall that the UK was very supportive of what the EU was trying to do um, to build a strong Euro. And they understood um, the importance for Britain of um, a strong European economy. But the political and the legal changes that were necessary to support the euro were becoming increasingly difficult um, for domestic UK politics. And I want to recall uh, very vividly a moment that I think I will remember to the end of my days. And that was being in the European Council of December 2011. And at about two o'clock in the morning, David Cameron said, um, listen guys, I can't do it. I can't do uh, another EU treaty, even if I support the euro and all the rest of it. And they said to him, David, we're going ahead with or without you. And that's how we got the fiscal compact treaty, because you can only change the EU treaties by unanimity, but the euro needed to have a new treaty, so we had to do it by an internationally binding treaty outside of the EU treaties because of that. But what I remember most of that night was this shock feeling in the pit of my stomach that, oh my God, we, we, we've come to the edge of the abyss. There could be a parting of the ways. This, this could be the moment when it's not possible to find any reasonable compromise. Now, after that night, things got papered over, but it was a seminal moment. And of course, looking back now um, on what happened in the Brexit vote, I do see it as a very important moment. And um, I want to quote from um, a very interesting and insightful speech that Ivan Rogers made recently. Ivan was the UK's permanent representative who resigned very publicly, and I think quite prophetically, um, in January 2017. Um, but in this, this speech, he said of that particular night, um, of that particular European Council, and I'm going to quote now, he said, it was very nearly the moment of terminal rupture between the UK and the EU and its role as a harbinger of what lay ahead and a catalyst for decisions on both sides, which led inexorably to Brexit, has, in my view, been hugely underestimated. And he goes on to explain that Prime Minister Cameron felt, and again I'm going to quote, Cameron felt the need to make even clearer that there were not two speeds of membership involving all going to the same destination, some by the express and some trundling by the slow train. There had to be clear recognition that there were viable, different, permanent destinations within the EU and that not all were inexorably heading to a banking union, a fiscal union and a political union. Now, for me, that quote actually epitomises the changes that came from the financial crisis. Um, the euro was always a political project as well as an economic one. Um, and the euro, uh, ensuring its survival, became the core agenda of the EU. And while some differences, especially of timing and speed, could be accommodated, um, it became clear that basically all member states had to accept that they were in fact bound for a banking union, a fiscal union and a political union sooner or later. Um, because the EU, as I said, was moving beyond the common market, beyond the single market, into other territory, and the UK's Tory leaders felt that they, they could not journey um, uh, in the same direction with the others. So, for me, these were the factors leading up to the, the June 2016 uh, Brexit vote. Um, it means that the post-Brexit -E EU will be a different place. Um, enlargement will shape that. The failure uh, to get the constitutional treaty through is shaping the political circumstances. An existential crisis of the fledgling euro and the dawning recognition that the EU couldn't permanently accommodate a member who was not on board for the journey. All of these things 
um, are in the mix of, of where we're going to go from here. Now, what I'd like to do now is to look at six, um, a mix of threats and, and challenges that I think are going to be the things that will define um, where the post-Brexit EU will go. Um, and paradoxically, I'm going to start with the UK, actually, um, because I think the UK had, has had quite a remarkable impact on the development of the EU agenda over the last 40 years and especially over the last 20 years. Um, in keeping with its traditionally global outlook uh, and its support for free markets, it has steered the EU away from some of its um, uh, protectionist temptations um, and it's helped it to prosper, riding the wave of globalisation. Um, it's also been fighting against um, Brussels' tendency to interfere in domestic matters and of course the UK has been the champion of better regulation. Now for London, better regulation means less uh, regulation of course. More negatively in my view, the UK um, has long opposed attempts to build a strong social dimension for the EU. You only have to think about the dance of different um, British governments in and out of the social protocol. Um, but overall, I feel the UK has brought a very serious expertise and a rigour of analysis to so many EU initiatives. Um, and while their objections and um, their questioning of money proposals has been irritating, a pain in the neck, frustrating uh, at many times, it has also, I think, led to better overall quality of decision making um, and um, uh, implementation as well because things like the costs of EU action were being thrashed out in advance um, and how things would be implemented were being worked out in advance too. But having said that, I want to come back to the different agenda because th as I said the EU started as a Franco-German project and it has been um, decisively influenced by those two countries sense of Europe's future destiny. The UK had an impact on the agenda but it didn't sway the EU from its fundamental course. And the Franco-German motor, um, I think, will continue to shape most significant developments in the EU, not only because of their size, but because of their history, and because they have an emotional and a political commitment to making it work. And I think that was often underestimated um, by the UK and by, by um, media commentators. For me, the departure of the UK means that France and Germany will be more than ever in the driving seat um, and uh, when it comes to determining the future direction and most of all the speed of integration. Um, for example, both uh, France and Germany agree on, economic, on the need for economic and monetary union, but they don't agree on the detail and they don't agree on the pace of progress. Um, and for me it's very interesting to see the efforts that President Macron is making to bring the French deficit into line with um, the EU requirements, obviously primarily for domestic reasons, but also to prove to Germany that France can be a reliable and serious partner for Euro reform. Um, Germany is very hesitant about the ideas that are going around for um, economic and monetary reform. They know it's necessary, but they're afraid of being asked to pay, to pay the bill. And I think they also doubt whether some of their partners have really had a lasting conversion to the virtues of fiscal rectitude. Um, so in my view, these differences don't mean um, uh, that it will alter the direction of future policy. What it does mean is it will give us some political drama from time to time, uh, and it will affect the, the speed at which we go. But for me, the overall political direction is clearly set, no matter how long it takes to get there. It's set as a political choice, but it's also set by the necessity of underpinning the euro because although the euro has survived a very tough test, it still isn't sufficiently mature and anchored to be the stable currency that, that the EU needs. Um, I do have um, some concerns about um, this stronger Franco-German stamp on the future agenda. I'm just going to mention one of them, uh, which I mentioned uh, briefly in passing a moment ago. And that is that although there are differences between them, I think both countries can sometimes be prey to protectionist tendencies. Um, and I think we will have to work just that little bit harder to keep the EU open to the outside world in the future once the UK um, has, has departed. In my view, the EU has prospered because of being um, part of an open rules-based international trade system. And in particular, smaller member states very much rely on this model. Um, and I think that we will need to continue to champion a multilateral, rules-based uh, trade system uh, for the future. 
given the changes in US policy, perhaps there is a need for Europe to step up more um, and to champion um, uh, an international trade system which relies on multilateral enforceable rules. Um, other countries are asking the EU to do this. They, they are afraid of might being right and they would prefer to see uh, a rules-based, uh, more representative system for the future. And the EU itself, I think, is very interested in pursuing uh, new trade deals with partners around the world to continue to perpetuate this model that has worked very well for us. Um, so that was my, my first um, challenge, uh, was about the, the more continental, more Franco-German model for the future. Secondly, I want to talk about something that may sound, that will sound a bit techy, um, but I think that has potential um, to be uh, an interesting factor for the future, and that is the shift to a more clearly defined and agreed agenda for the EU. Um, so in 2016, we had the UK vote to leave. We then had um, the member states meeting in Bratislava, uh, trying to decide what was going to be their response. And um, they adopted a declaration that I'm going to quote from because I think it's um, relevant to, to the, the points I want to make. So I quote, um, they said, we need to improve communication with each other among member states, with EU institutions, but most importantly with our citizens. We should inject more clarity into our decisions, use clear and honest language, focus on citizens' expectations, with the strong courage to challenge simplistic solutions of extreme or populist political forces. Well, we could say yes, please. Um, they subsequently then adopted a roadmap, as the EU does, um, in which they promised to set out what they called an attractive vision of an, uh, uh, sorry, a vision of an attractive EU they can trust and support, they being the citizens. Um, and I think that um, those are important um, statements of intent. Um, I want to give you another quote which comes from uh, when the 27, already minus the UK, met in Rome to celebrate the 60th anniversary of signing the Treaty of Rome. And there they said, um, 60 years ago, recovering from the tragedy of two world wars, we decided to bond together and rebuild our continent from its ashes. We have built a unique union with common institutions and strong values, a community of peace, freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, a major economic power with unparalleled levels of social protection and welfare. And I think these bits and bobs of different declarations are actually political manifestos for the future, as well as a kind of a statement of, of accomplishment. But of course, the challenge is how can 27 governments representing 400 plus million people, um, many, many organizations with very different ideas, um, how can they agree on what they call an attractive vision? Because what appeals in one part of the EU could easily be anathema in another part. And in my experience, when the member states come together to try to find common ground, what they usually find is the lowest common denominator. Um, so it would be, I think it would help if we could actually adjust our expectations of what we want the EU to deliver to what it's actually able to deliver and not judge its efforts in the same way that we judge national politicians or popularity contests. Um, I think the, by this I mean that we should see the EU as adding to the way that we choose to run our own countries, not taking away from it and not uh, trying to replace it. The EU should be big on big things and small on small things, as my former boss, President Barroso, used to like to say. And I think we should accept that the EU will always be built on compromise and that it will never be a larger projection of, of our national view. And if it was, we probably wouldn't like it, because if the EU was ever to be a bigger version of a national view, it would be of the biggest member states, and most of us are small member states, and we wouldn't like that, I think. Um, so we need to rehabilitate compromise, I think. Uh, we need to see it as a positive way of working, and not, as many portray it, as a sign of weakness. Um, and it is striking that almost all European governments are coalitions, so compromise for them is a daily exercise. So why shouldn't it be um, the same at EU level? Um, we will also need to accept that this attractive vision, and it should be a narrative that people can get behind, but we should have an understanding that it will have to be delivered through a lot of technical rules. Um, if you think back to the single market in 1992, that's hailed today as visionary, and it was visionary, but it wasn't delivered all at once. It was delivered through 300 
excruciatingly boring technical regulations, but they added up to the internal market, and there was a movement uh, to support the internal market, and, and then people didn't mind about the 300 sets of regulations. Um, it brought me to mind of, the, of a quote I like very much from the West Wing series, when they said, uh, we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. I think that, that, that's really how the EU works. Um, so to move towards a, a more clearly defined and hopefully attractive agenda, I think that the EU is finding its way and can move towards um, working out more in advance which proposals it's going to champion and work on and which ones it's not going to take up. Um, I think that the Commission makes much better proposals today because they're based on evidence, they're impact assessed, uh, there's a lot of public consultation, um, and I think this is the, the better regulation um, that I certainly um, see as a positive in the way that the Commission works. Um, and uh, maybe one of the unintended uh, consequences of the UK pressure for more, i.e. less regulation from their point of view, was that it actually means the Commission today comes forward with much stronger proposals because they're much better prepared and because they've passed a, a series of political tests before they, they get to be tabled uh, officially. Um, and I think this is important because what we are seeing is the Commission gradually feeling its way towards um, a more clear and explainable agenda. Um, when President Barroso was standing for a second term, he actually published his manifesto. And when he was voted by the European Parliament, they voted on the manifesto, which then became his work program. And when President Juncker was campaigning across Europe as the first Spitzenkandidat of the EU, um, I think he was quite shocked to meet um, ordinary people who felt that the EU was interfering in little things and not getting on with the big things. So he has set out 10 priorities for his commission and he's sticking to them. Um, and I think that this could be the way of the future. Um, there's already seeds of this there. Um, about a year before European elections, the Council and the Parliament both realised that they're not going to be able to adopt all of the proposals on the table. So they sit together and they work out which proposals they're going to pick to give priority to to get them adopted before the parliament breaks for the elections. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when the process I was describing of the Barroso Manifesto and the Juncker 10 priorities, um, when that became clear that that was the driving force in the way the commission was working, um, the member states got a bit worried because they felt, oh, the commission is getting too close to the parliament now. We should have our own priority list. And so they produced their priority list. Now, this is all very messy. This is all very confused. But I think out of this can come a more clear and more readable agenda for the future where the institutions could agree, say, at the beginning of each parliament, um, which are the priority proposals they're going to work on. And then they should invest all of their energies in delivering them. You'd have to make room, of course, for emergencies. You know, crises happen all the time. But if there was um, uh, a clear agenda that you could explain, a kind of program for government for the EU, uh, it would make it, I think, much more readable and come closer to giving the kind of certainty and avoiding surprises, which are what um, make people very nervous about the EU because they say, well, we never know what you're going to come out with next, you know, and we've only just got that one agreed and here you are asking us to do something else. So I think... As part of the maturing of the EU process, um, there could be this um, emergence of a more clearly defined and upfront agenda for what we're going to do together at EU level uh, and then uh, what we're not going to do together at EU level. Of course, part of the challenge would be that member states and parliament would have to resist then all the pressure that would come for all the proposals that were left off the list. But you can't have it every way. You can't have clarity and Brussels focusing on big things EU uh, doing what it needs to do and doing hundreds of small things as well just to please different constituencies. But it will take time, but I feel that, that we, are, we are moving slowly towards that. Um, I've already mentioned economic and monetary union several times, so I'm going to be rather brief on this as my third point because it's one thing that it's absolutely certain will mark um, post-Brexit EU just as, as it has already marked uh, pre-Brexit EU. Um, there are lots of ideas being tabled at the moment. Um, the kind of ideas include having a European Monetary Fund that would um, help member states um, when they would get into economic distress in the future. It would act as a lender of last resort uh, for the resolution of distressed banks. 
There are proposals to have new budgetary instruments to support um, structural change in member states, to support those who, who wish to join the euro, and all countries, once the UK goes, all countries except Denmark have an obligation to join the euro whenever they can convince their populations of that, and a proposal to have a, a European, um, minister, an EU minister for finance. Um, all of these ideas that are floating around at the moment would mean greater discipline in national economic and, and fiscal policy, and that would be more tightly coordinated by the Eurogroup under the chairmanship of the EU Minister for Finance. Um, they would also, of course, then lead to um, Euro area member states having access to deeper uh, pools for borrowing um, and um, more risk sharing uh, between member states and so on. This additional discipline will not sit all that easily with some um, across the EU, but it is the price that we will have to pay uh, to have a strong euro and to have the advantages that will come from that. And I think that over time it will um, actually reduce risk and help us to converge towards much more resilient economic and social structures. At present, though, there is what I call a kind of unholy alliance between two groups of member states that see things very differently. You have, on the one hand, those who don't want to do more, so those who don't want more discipline, and those who don't want to pay more. And at the moment, those two groups are working together because they don't want to have to do any more. That will change um, as we get deeper into discussing what kind of um, economic and monetary union we, we want to have. I hope that we can reach these decisions now when the economy is relatively benign. Um, but I do keep in mind what Money said about necessity and crisis, and uh, I fear that we may have to get close to another crisis before some of the decisions will make it past the, um, the um, post of adoption. Um, for me, I, I said I would say something about the advent of a president of the European Council, and for me, one of the interesting um, outcomes of the Lisbon Treaty um, is the way that gradually the president of the Commission, the president of the European Council are working together. And this is really exemplified by the work that they have been doing with different people in those roles, that they have been doing on economic and monetary union. Both presidents, um, both sets of presidents have produced, I think, very important designs for EMU. Um, they have gradually associated the president of the ECB, the president of the Eurogroup, and the president of the European Parliament with their work. And um, I think that's a very powerful way of advancing the big issues on the European agenda. Um, strictly from a Commission point of view, um, I sometimes worry that that's an intrusion into the Commission's right of initiative and the Commission's area of expertise. But um, from the Realpolitik point of view, I think it's a very powerful way of working. If you put together the technical expertise of the Commission with the political knowledge that the President of the European Council has of the political situation in the Member States and also their likely room for manoeuvre, when you put all of that together and present the Member States then with this composite of ideas, um, it must have a very powerful influence um, in their debates. My fourth point um, is going to be about the need for a stronger social dimension. Um, I think one of the lessons from the failed constitution and from the rise of populist anti-EU forces is that economic success is not enough on its own to make the EU succeed. There has to be a clear commitment to improving welfare and to uh, sharing the benefits of membership more widely. In the Rome Declaration that I mentioned, the 27 pledged to work towards a long list of things, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but um, they pledge to work towards a, a union which promotes economic and social progress, as well as cohesion and convergence. They talk about equality, uh, equal rights. They talk about a union which fights unemployment, discrimination, social exclusion and poverty. A union where young people receive the best education and training and can study and find jobs across the continent. A union which preserves our cultural heritage and promotes cultural diversity. And this is a very carefully balanced, carefully crafted um, declaration, and it sets out very high ambitions for the EU. Um, in an area where it is difficult because the treaty provisions on the social policy are much weaker than the economic provisions, so the EU has always seemed to be a bit lopsided because it has wide powers and got more powers as a result of the 2008 crisis, much less powers in the social area. Um, I think there is um, much less agreement between member states. 
uh, on what they actually want the EU to do in the social area. And this is one area where the UK's uh, membership has been a negative, in my view, because um, it has made any meaningful progress on a social agenda almost impossible because they perceived it as such a political minefield for them in domestic policy terms. So I think this is one area where moving um, beyond Brexit, um, the EU can begin to develop a more, a more um, visible um, social policy. Um, I think it's an area where there has to be a lot of room for national practice and tradition, uh, respecting the very different roles that the social partners have in different countries. Um, but you can't get away from the fact that the EU needs to create uh, a, a different image of itself, one that shows that it does, and it does care about it. Of course it cares about what happens to its citizens, but it needs to find a more visible way to show that EU policy takes into account the needs of the, the most vulnerable um, of EU citizens. And I think this will be spurred on also by the realisation that rising inequality is actually going to obstruct the EU from achieving its objectives unless they pay attention to it. Um, and I see um, uh, the beginning of this process coming from the summit um, that the EU leaders had in Gothenburg recently uh, in November, uh, where they promised to put people first. Um, and I think this is a tentative recognition of the need to be more visible in the social area. But I think to square this circle about uh, leaving wide room for national practice, uh, for accepting that member states have very different views on social policy, um, but nonetheless that there has to be an EU dimension to it, that's going to be a hard uh, circle to square, but they will have to do it to give real meaning to the EU social dimension um, in advance. Now, if you're still counting with me, I come to number five of my six points. Um, and that is a really difficult nut to crack. It's the migration crisis. I think I see it actually as the most difficult item on, on the current EU agenda and, and going into the future. Um, a few years, I want to step back though because I want to explain a little bit. Um, a few years ago, the EU didn't cover uh, justice and home affairs at all. That was national sovereignty. They were domestic issues, not for the EU. And then the member states started to meet among themselves without the commission because they recognized that they had common problems and that maybe common solutions could be a good idea. Then they thought subsequently, well, maybe um, we could let the commission into the meetings, but they can't speak. And then a little bit later on, they thought, well, maybe the commission might occasionally have something worth listening to, so they allowed us to speak. And so we come to a situation where uh, we were tiptoeing towards working together in the area of justice and home affairs. But there was no robust system in place um, by the time the crisis hit us. And there was certainly no system in place that was um, able to deal with wave upon wave of refugees and um, economic migrants that we have seen um, in, in recent times. So um, to build up a capacity to act in this area is going to take time. And that's one of the reasons why it's such a crisis. Um, but I think um, the other reason is that um, we have um, big differences between member states and, and actually an east-west split. Um, and that um, comes from um, the fact that member states are at different stages of development, um, a lack of solidarity, I think. Um, but um, this is going to be, um, until it is solved, a huge problem for the EU to deal with. It will not go away because the EU is a magnet. We, we are fortunate enough to live in an area of peace, of prosperity, where individual rights are respected. And it's very easy to understand why those who don't have those benefits would try to come to Europe. And we can't take everybody in. So what we need to have is a well-controlled policy, stronger borders, so that the EU can decide who comes in legally, who gets the right to stay, and that those who don't get the right to stay cannot stay in the EU. We have to get that um, calibration right. Uh, but um, it will take time to persuade all of the member states to do it in a way that shares the burden, that, um, that lives up to the, the core values of the EU, of, of solidarity and of, of basic respect for human rights. But we also need to do it for economic reasons. And I think we have to face up to the fact that across Europe our populations are ageing, our birth rates are falling. And we will need uh, controlled inward migration just to keep up the standard of living and the way of life that we are so comfortable with. Um, and I think that um, we have to get 
to tackle this in a more honest way. Um, I think given the EU's own history, uh, we can't run away from this. But even if you take it away from the moral and the political dimension, um, member states cannot cope with the migration price, crisis on their own. And if they don't tackle it together, they will all suffer um, much more uh, than the, the, the effort of coming together to find it. And as, um, as my former boss um, and, uh, and very much um, lamented, um, Peter Sutherland said, history will judge us very harshly by what we do um, on this particular crisis. And I think he was absolutely right to take the moral high ground and to, to advocate a humane um, solution to this crisis. There is no quick solution. It's going to take um, a lot of work over a lot of years because um, Europe will have to work together, as I said, on border control, on having a common visa policy, a common asylum policy. But more than that, um, we will have to um, look at the sources of the migratory flows. We're going to have to invest much more in much more effective development policy. Um, because I don't believe that most people want to leave their home country. If they had the prospect of a, of a reasonable um, life in both in economic terms and in terms of um, not being afraid of the state, of having their rights respected, I think most people would want to stay at home. So the EU, and you can see the beginning of, of much more um, organised EU outreach to Africa um, in the last 12 months as part of the response to, to the migration crisis. But of course, that means that we're going to have to pay more as well. Um, none of these things come for free, but um, in the end you have to pay. And whether you pay in a productive way of trying to help countries uh, develop to the point where they can offer their own populations uh, sufficient intensives to stay, or whether you pay by trying to um, build a wall around the EU that will not work, um, in the end we have to face up to the realities um, of the changing world and to... To, to do some straight talking between member states to hammer out a, an acceptable solution. Um, I'm going to make a bridge now between talking straight on migration and my, my sixth point, which is about tackling populism and anti-EU nationalism, because these are very connected. Um, I think member states are going to have to speak more frankly to their populations on migration and to explain um, that it can be beneficial, that we actually need it, to convince their populations that we can control it, but that we have to um, be more open to migration in the future because, because we will need it, because it's a moral thing to do, but also because we will need it for our own um, economic development in the future. And that leads me to go on more generally to the kind of um, ugly populism and jingoistic nationalism that um, is on the rise in several member states. Um, and I think that the leaders need to do a lot more to bring their national and their EU discourse together in order to tackle this. It's very easy um, for national politicians to take the credit for things that are decided in Brussels that they think will be popular, and then to blame Brussels for everything else. But to do that on a constant basis, you end up with a result like the, the Brexit vote in the UK. They had 40 years of negative drip feed. It finally corroded to the point where they voted to leave. Um, and I have to say that I find it quite appalling that after each European Council, every Prime Minister or President finds it necessary to come out and give a different version of the meeting that they've just attended. A meeting where they spent hours arguing over the text of the conclusions of what they had agreed. Um, why do they then have to come out and say something different? Why can't they let their agreed text speak for itself? Why do they all have to come out and say, we won, we got an advantage over the others? The good news should be that, yet again, the EU has found a good compromise uh, to difficult problems. And uh, until we can break this disconnect between what goes on in Brussels and what goes on at home, I think we're going to continue to have to contend with um, populism and anti-EU nationalism. Um, that's not to say that Brussels doesn't have to do more to explain to people what it's doing to explain the benefits of the membership, etc. But I think until the member states make that connection and talk a lot more openly and a lot more often to their own populations about what's going on in Brussels and why they are supporting certain decisions and why they're not supporting others, then I think we leave too much ground to um, the slick anti-EU soundbite and to those who come with simplistic and usually unworkable solutions to, as I said earlier, what are inherently um, very complex uh, problems.
Now, I think it's very positive that the Irish government has decided to have a citizens' dialogue on the future of the EU, and I hope that lots of organisations and individuals will, will contribute to that process. Um, I know that the EU can often seem arcane and obsessed with its own internal processes, um, and I don't blame people for being turned off by that, but it's vitally important that um, the regular citizen, a majority of citizens, support the EU and that they feel well represented and served by it uh, and that they should push their governments to make a contribution to it. Um, uh, and I find it very telling that throughout all of the difficulties, opinion poll after opinion poll in Greece showed that a majority of Greeks wanted to stay in the EU and they wanted to stay in the Euro. Uh, and I think it's also very telling that Marine Le Pen quietly dropped her pitch to take France out of the Euro if she was to succeed uh, in being elected when she realised that it wasn't actually popular with the majority. And similarly with her policy to, to take France out of the EU. But um, when up to a third of citizens are voting for these kind of parties, then you have to listen and you have to heed the message and you have to try and find a way uh, to, to explain to them um, if the, the majority, I think, want to stay in the EU, but they probably want to stay in a different kind of EU. And I think that's um, the challenge for where we go next from here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ireland now, because I think Ireland's membership of the EU is going to be very different post-Brexit. We need to think a lot in the coming months about the implications <clears throat> for us in a different EU. Um, we need to work out uh, what do we want the EU to be, what do we want it to do and what do we want it to develop? And as I see it, in a way we're kind of entering into a third phase of our membership. We joined as a small poor country on the edge of Europe. We were only allowed to join when the UK joined. We weren't welcomed on our own. Then we had the Celtic Tiger phase. We became markedly more Eurosceptic. And then we had the crash. And so now we're a bit chastened, I think, by, by what happened. Um, and we're very worried about what's going to happen when our nearest neighbour is no longer around the EU table um, fighting um, similar causes to ourselves. So we're at the point where we need a new narrative. We, we're going to have to have a kind of mature reflection as, as a grown-up uh, net contributor to the EU budget uh, rather than a taker. What is it now that we think is important about our membership and how are we going to define it and discuss it with, with our citizens? Um, I think that we know that we want to stay in. We rightly understand that the EU offers us the best prospect that we have of, of having an influence in a globalised world. But we have to work out, um, what do we think about economic and monetary union? It's not exactly the burning subject in the pubs around Ireland at the moment. We have to work out what kind of social dimension do we want. We are very influenced here by the British view on, on the social dimension of Europe. So we're going to have to work out now, without them, what kind of social dimension do we think the European Union should have? What do we think about migration? We're not the ones who are having waves and waves upon people coming to, to our shores. We're going to have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to pay into the EU budget? Are we prepared to pay more into the EU budget to have it succeed in meeting the challenges, the kind of challenges that I've outlined at the moment? Um, I think all in all, in recent years, we've been quite happy to sort of coast along and to let the UK fight the battles against uh, the kind of um, initiatives that we don't regard as welcome. We've had an occasional burst of activity when we've had to vote twice on certain treaties, when there's been occasionally things we don't like, but for the most part, um, we haven't asked ourselves these deep and searching questions in the way that other member states have. Um, and I think when they're gone, um, we will find it very different. We're going to have to invest much earlier in deep thinking about what position do we take, what do we think about these issues, and, and where do we see Ireland, um, what position do we want to defend, what do we want the EU to do, and what do we not want the EU to do. Um, and then we're going to have to develop policy positions that we can share with other member states, and we're going to have to travel to see them, because most of them won't come to Dublin, so we're going to have to be travelling a lot more to other capitals to, to discuss with them, and to build alliances for the kind of policies that we want, and for um, alliances against the kind of policies that we don't want. And we're going to have to spend a lot of time getting to know and understand much better our EU neighbours, um, because I think we have neglected um, what's going on um, in the continent in lots of ways, because we, we are part of an English-speaking bubble. It's very easy to be influenced by that. Um, and uh, when the UK is gone, 
we will see the, confident, the, the continent perhaps more clearly, but we will realise that we don't know it enough and we'll have to invest much more in, in those relationships. Um, we'll have to make compromises. And sometimes we'll have to swallow things we don't like for the sake of compromise. Um, I think Ireland has seen huge solidarity in recent months. Um, and that solidarity was genuinely and generously given. But of course, the other member states will expect that solidarity in return on issues that will be of huge importance to, to them when the time comes. And I think we have to boost the level of debate here in Ireland, in the Dáil, um, in the media, in business and social organisations, and directly with citizens. And um, it's because I see Ireland as being at a very crucial moment of choice that I accepted tonight's lecture, but also um, that why I'm on the boards of the European Movement Ireland and the uh, Institute for European Affairs. It's because I want to bring my particular perspective and my experience of, of working in Brussels to that debate, because I think it's such an important time for Ireland to, to work out um, where it's going um, in, the future, in the future of the EU. And I think for very understandable reasons, it's Brexit is dominating the horizon here. It's a kind of all-consuming subject. And it is very important. Of course, it's very important. And we will all be consumed by every twist and turn of the negotiations. But I think it's very important that we already invest in seeing beyond it. It's a huge issue now. But once the UK has gone after a few years and we have settled into a new relationship with them, it will be the other factors I'm talking about that are much more important in shaping the EU for the future. And you'll be glad to hear I'm coming now to my conclusion. Um, so I started by asking the question in the title of my talk, um, will the post-Brexit EU be different? And my answer is obviously that it will be. Um, I've talked about the forces that um, go well beyond Brexit in shaping uh, the future direction of the EU enlargement, um, the rejection of the constitution, the, the economic and financial crisis, um, the need to address income and social inequality, the migration crisis, populism, anti-EU nationalism. The departure of the UK will be a loss, I think mostly for their citizens, but also for the rest of the EU, because we're going to miss um, uh, what they brought to, to, to the EU table in terms of expertise and pragmatism and their role as, as one of the bigger member states. Um, obviously, the wider international environment is also going to have a strong influence um, on future EU developments, so decisions taken in the US, in China, in Africa, will all have an influence on us and um, will call for a response from us. Um, I think that the old Macmillan saying of events, dear boy, events, is going to be obviously what you can't predict, but what's going to shape the agenda. But I feel that the EU isn't quite ready yet to step up to the role that the rest of the world expects the European Union to play now in the post-Trump um, era and with what's happening in Russia, etc. Um, it's both hard and expensive to live up to your principles. And I think the EU isn't quite ready yet uh, to step into the, the vacuum that's been created. But I do think as confidence returns and as, um, as the gap that the UK will leave behind closes over, then I think Europe is going to want to and seek to take on a wider world role in the years to come because the EU agenda is changing. And um, we have reached a level of maturity in a lot of internal policies. Um, the best way I can describe it is that um, once upon a time, the famous acquis communautaire, which is the body of legislation and obligations each member state has, that used to be the exclusive preserve of the commission. But now every head of every department in national, regional, local government is an expert in their area of the acquis communautaire. Um, and they know how to implement it, and they do it most of the time anyway. Um, so there's less need to radically overhaul and come with new policies in established areas. And that gives the EU, I think, more time to concentrate on the big issues that member states simply cannot tackle on their own. Um, I think we have to change the image of the EU as this kind of relentless, monstrous, bureaucratic machine that's constantly seeking to expand its own power and glory and swallow up member state competences. I think over the years we have seen a return of certain powers to the member states in a, an area like competition policy, for example. And I think that there is more room for power sharing and delegation um, so that you get a, a better delineation between the EU doing the big things that have to be done together because member states can't do it on their own 
and um, maybe leaving a bit more diversity and more room to the member states to, to manage the, the differences that don't fundamentally affect um, the EU agenda. I think many European visitors when they go to the United States are quite surprised to see that the states are far less integrated than Europe um, is today. And there's different reasons for where the US is and where the EU is. But I think that um, we could have a bit more diversity. And we, might e we do even like the fact that our neighbours do some things differently from us. It's, it's more interesting when you travel around. So I think um, to get that balance right is still a work in progress, but I think uh, we will get there. And as I've said, um, Ireland, I think, is going to have to work a lot harder in future to, um, to have its voice heard, but also to decide what it wants to give voice to. Um, and I think there will be a lot of small member states going through the same kind of analysis now, thinking that they're going to have to work differently in future, looking for new alliances, looking to see who can they team up with. So I think um, there, there can be um, a lot of coming together. Um, and um, I think that um, what you see from 45 years of shared membership of the EU for Ireland and the UK is that um, we, the relationship has changed totally. Um, there's a much better balance of um, respect and uh, maturity in the relationship now, and this is an asset that I think we should strive to keep after the UK leaves, and I think that both we and they will have a, um, uh, an interest in doing that, because much as we would love them to stay, I think the likelihood is that they are going to leave in March 2019. And the challenge is to find a way for them to leave and still stay close to us. And I think that is very much what Ireland is working to achieve. And I hope that um, the, the UK will see the wisdom and the, the, that their pragmatic, their usual pragmatic sense will kick in again and that they will see staying close to the European Union even while they leave it um, would be the better um, course of action for them. I want to finish um, by telling you about uh, one of my proudest moments as Secretary General of the, the European Commission, and that was um, in December 2012 when I was at the ceremony in Oslo where the EU received the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and the citation um, from the Nobel Committee said that the Nobel Committee wishes to focus on what it sees as the EU's most important result, the successful struggle for peace and reconciliation and for democracy and human rights. The stabilizing part played by the EU has helped to transform most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. And for me, today's successful struggle, to take their terms, is thankfully not about war and peace. But it is about how a group of relatively small European countries, which are united by a strong vision, can shape their own destiny through harmonious compromise at the same time as they try to be a force for good in the world. And I think that double effort is needed in today's world more than ever. So the post-Brexit EU will be different, um, and my hope is that it will be stronger, more relevant to its citizens, and more united in its diversity. Thank you very much.